Well, good morning. Welcome to Worship at Gospel Fellowship PCA. My name is Matt, one of the pastors. Very glad to have you here with us this morning, especially if you're new or visiting. Uh, hello, glad you're here. Gospel Fellowship is a Bible-believing church. We love Jesus. We're on a mission to share the gospel with the world. So if you're looking for a church like that, you found one this morning. We're glad you're here. Hey, by the way, if you are visiting, there's a yellow card right in front of you in the pew rack. You can fill that out for us. Give us a little bit of information about yourself. We'd love to be able to follow up with you in any way that may be appropriate. You can put some prayer requests on that card. Just put it in the offering plate as it goes by, or better yet, you can take it out the door, hand it to one of the ushers or pastors or greeters after the service. That would be just fine. Well, we continue to have three services here on the Lord's Day, 8.30, 11, and 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock is outside in the pavilion, if you'd rather. So beautiful weather this time of year, so maybe you'll join us outside at the pavilion at some point. And if you miss anything, our messages are on our YouTube page, and we have a podcast as well. Just search for Gospel Fellowship PCA, and you can catch up with all of our digital content that way. Hey, listen, we have so many announcements this morning. I'm just going to kind of rifle through it here. First of all, this is officer nomination time of the year. So if you're a member of Gospel Fellowship, you can nominate a man for office of elder or deacon. There's green forms out there on the table to the right, and you just simply nominate the person, uh, talk to them about it. They have to be a member too, of course, and then we'll put that process in motion. Uh, for those who are interested in leadership in our church in any way, whether it be ordained offices or Bible study teachers, leaders, small group, fellowship directors, all that kind of stuff, we have a course called the Leadership Course coming up in October. It's going to be October 9, 16, and 23. And in that class, Saturday mornings, we're going to be talking about Reformed theology and practical leadership skills. If you have any inclination to lead something or help to teach or anything like that, that's the course that you might want to on-ramp with. There's a sign-up sheet for that on the table in the back. Uh, we also have a new inquirers class happening right now. We're just starting this new class. If you're interested in joining the church as a member, that'd be the way to do that. Glenn Ogershock, one of our elders, is the teacher for that course, and that takes place at the Sunday school hour. Finally, this, and I'm going to have David come up in just a sec to talk about Sunday school. I want to mention the church plants out in Cranberry, the northern uh, area of Cranberry. We're looking to plant a church in the Evans City or Zelianople area. And our initial organizational meeting for that church planting endeavor is this Wednesday, this Wednesday, September 15th. We're going to be borrowing some space from Crossroads Church on Peters Road. And so here's the deal. We're going to be having our regular adult Bible study on Wednesday nights here every week. No changes there. I'll be here teaching Bible study Wednesday nights. But simultaneously, at the same time, we'll also be doing our church planting Bible study out on the northern uh, part of Cranberry, the southwest corner of Butler County. So if you know anybody out in Evans City, Zealinopa, we love to make contacts for people that would want to be part of a PCA church planting endeavor. All right, David, come up, tell us a little bit about Sunday School. Thank you, brother. Uh, Matthew mentioned uh, an inquirer's class that's been running now. There's two other Sunday School classes uh, that I wanted to uh, make you aware of. One is an awesome class that began last week uh, entitled Servants of Sovereign Joy. Uh, our ruling elders, for the most part, are taking us through the biographies of a number of men in church history, some very early on in the life of the church, uh, New Testament church, some more recent. Uh, so that is going to meet in the sanctuary uh, and continuing on next week. Um, there is also another class. If you go through, uh, through this side door, wind all the way around to the end of the hallway uh, in the back classroom, Rob Olszewski and myself are teaching a class entitled Suffering Well. Uh, where we look at how the scriptures tell us to think about suffering uh, and then spend much of our time considering particular topics related to suffering and persons in the scriptures. Uh, Rob and I will start that class next week, uh, so if that's of interest to you, uh, you can join us then. Uh, today, we actually have a missionary that we can hear from uh, in this room um, at 940 or so, so be sure to join us for that. Thank you.
Scripture says that the Lord made the heavens and the earth in six days, but he rested on the seventh. And therefore, we have this, the Christian Sabbath, together, together to worship, to praise him, and to acknowledge his name. Let's be called then into worship this morning using a portion of Psalm 94 printed in your bulletin. Scripture says, The Lord will not forsake his people. He will not abandon his heritage. When the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. The Lord has become my stronghold and my God, the rock of my refuge. Let's go ahead and stand up together. If you're able to stand, we're going to sing hymn number 101, Come Thou Almighty King. together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we do pray that for Christ's sake and according to what he himself deserves, that you would be pleased to fill us with your spirit. Uh, Lord God, in our worship, may it be true that we have indeed met with you. We do pray that by faith we might rightly and truly behold your glory. You who dwell in all holiness, goodness, wisdom, truth, power, and justice, our God, as we acknowledge your perfections, we pray as well that you would give us a true sense of our own sin, a conviction that even comes from the very heart of knowing what our sin is as it begins in our thoughts, proceeds even to what we have spoken and things that we have done. Lord God, we know that our sin is deserving of your condemnation, not only for what it is in itself, but because first it is against you, the holy and true God. We do pray that out of your abundant mercy, that you would be kind to us, that you would cleanse us from our sin. Remember our sins no more. Consider instead the blood of Christ Jesus, our great high priest, whom you have appointed, in whom we trust, and by whom there is forgiveness of sins. These things we do pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, scripture tells us in the book of Hebrews that since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. This is a privilege that we have through Christ Jesus to come boldly into the presence of our God. 
Uh, let's confess our faith together using this portion of he, uh, Romans 8 as printed in the bulletin. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> I do want to draw your attention to the fact that at the 11 o'clock we'll be receiving the Merle family, uh, be in prayer for them and thanksgiving to the Lord as he continues to add uh, to our number in this place. Uh, as we consider our tithes and offerings that we bring to the Lord, uh, listen from Philippians 4, verses 12 and 13. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Let's bring our tithes and gifts to the Lord. <laughs> stand if you're able and let's sing holy 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 to the lord God, we've brought these tithes and offerings unto you in faith as we look to you, our God and our provider. Uh, teach us to be content with whatever it is that you give and in every circumstance to find the strength that you provide in Christ Jesus to continue to serve you for the glory of your name. Use these glyphs, gifts for your glory, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Uh, let's recite together our verse of the month, beginning and ending with the citation. You can find it printed before you. Isaiah 54, 10. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Isaiah 54, 10. A reading for our New Testament reading, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. 
When our Savior comes into the world, uh, men from far away cannot help but come to him and worship him. Uh, Listen to the word of our God, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. May God add his blessing on this, the reading and hearing, his holy word. Uh, Let's remain seated. We'll continue worshiping uh, using Psalter Selection 94A.
together. I'm going to pray through some of the words of Psalm 94 this morning. Lord, you are the judge of all of the earth. Lord, we've just sang these truths to you from the same psalm and the Psalter. Lord, you know the thoughts of men, that they are uh, but breath. Lord, we are so small and weak before you. You are great and mighty above us. Lord, we do pray that you would teach us your law. God, that you would put your law in our hearts, that you would revive our dead hearts before you, Heavenly Father, that you would give us a true love for you and for Christ and for this broken world, Father, that we would rise together as the people of God and shine forth in truth and in righteousness and in steadfast love, Lord, reflecting back to you the love that you first give us in Christ. And we pray, Father, with Psalm 94, that you would not forsake your people. Lord, we are your people. You've redeemed us through the covenant of the blood of Christ. And God, while we fully acknowledge that we live in a world just filled with evildoers and wicked and the arrogant, Lord, those very same inclinations are resident within us. And we pray, God, that you would expel them from us. And make us more like your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, prevent us from having our foot slip, as it says in Psalm 94, 18. God, save us by your steadfast love and hold us up. For you are the rock of our refuge, our stronghold in the day of trouble. Father God, we do pray for those in our congregation who are needing the most help from your hand today. We think of Rob Olszewski and, of course, Gloria, his mother, Lord, we do pray that you would receive her into your, your eternal and everlasting arms in your good and due time. Lord, Psalm 139 says that all the days of our lives are numbered and they're in your book. And Lord, you know when you'll call her home. But I do pray for Rob even today as he sits by his mother's side. Lord, we also pray for those who are struggling with COVID. And there are some who are, who are ill, Lord. There are others who are sick, others who have very mild cases. But God, we do pray that you would protect us from the virus. Lord, put your mighty hand upon this congregation and protect us from the pestilence and the disease. Lord, I pray that those who contract it would have very mild cases and would recover quickly. Lord, we do pray for uh, our friend Ira, whose back is in great pain lately, asking for prayer requests this morning for his back. May you take away some of his discomfort. Father, as a nation, of course, this weekend, our, our minds... Our memories, our hearts are drawn back to 20 years ago on 9-11. Father, we do pray that in some way we would be able to honor those who served in that calamitous situation. We pray, Father, that you would protect our police, our fire departments, our EMTs. Lord, especially those who are doctors and, and nurses, may you, may you care for them, Heavenly Father, even as... They, of course, still continue to put themselves in harm's way. Lord, we think back 20 years ago to that tragedy, how in some strange way you brought unity to this nation. We pray, God, that you would do that again for a greatly polarized people. Lord, we pray, of course, that you would, you would not send such judgments upon us as you did on that occasion. But, Lord, instead that you would bring about forgiveness and revival in our hearts. Lord, that we would not have to be brought so low and humiliated to the dust in order to seek your face. God, save our nation, we pray, that your spirit would work upon us, Lord. We pray for faithful, Bible-believing, evangelical, Christ-preaching churches like ours, Lord, that you would raise them up across this land and that the churches themselves would be a light and witnesses and signposts to a dying world, that there is a greater hope in Christ. And Lord, let our church shine like a lamp of hope to this particular region. Father, we do pray also for our church planting efforts, God, that you would grant us your favor and success, that a new congregation might indeed be birthed in this area on the west side of our county, Lord. And may this Wednesday night be a momentous occasion in history, even if only a few people come, Lord. But we pray that we would look back on this day as the day that something began, something started, and that we would be a part of that, Heavenly Father. Lord, for ourselves this morning, we pray for the illumination of the reading of your word. God, please do not let your word wash over us helplessly as we have dull eyes and hearts. But Lord, instead, I pray that your word would be a blazing lamp to convict us, to enlighten us, to save, to sanctify. And God, may all of us here who hear your word read and preached this morning be drawn 
unto Christ, our Redeemer, through his word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And Lord, now hear us as we pray together, as Christ himself taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Church, let's go ahead and grab our Bibles. We're in Isaiah chapter 60 today. Isaiah 60 is the text. When you find that, let's stand up together, knowing that God's word is holy. It is infallible. It is inerrant. It is inspired. It is sufficient and beautiful to us. We stand to recognize this as we read God's word. Isaiah chapter 60. We're going to read verses 1 to 9, although the sermon will spill out into a few other verses in this chapter. But let's listen now to the word of God. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And the nations shall come to, to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see, they all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. And then you shall see and be radiant, your heart shall thrill and exult, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you, and the wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the Young camels of Midian and Ephah and all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. Verse 7, all the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you. They shall come up with acceptance on my altar and I will beautify my beautiful house. Who are those that fly like a cloud and like doves? To their windows, for the coastland shall hope for me. The ships of Tarshish first to bring your children from afar, their silver and gold with them, for the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has made you beautiful. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. You may be seated. I have to tell you a little, I, I feel bad about last week, especially for visitors, because I preached on backsliding last week, if you missed it, Isaiah 57, 17, and I really let you have it, I'm going to be honest, if you missed that sermon, you might want to catch that one on, uh, on video, but I was thinking to myself, even as I'm preaching, like, what are visitors going to think about this? Visitors who are maybe new to the congregation, we're seeing visitors almost every week now, if they walk in on this sermon, and here I am lambasting you all about backsliding, they're probably going to try to put two and two together and think that I'm upbraiding you for some particular thing that's happening in our congregation, which, by the way, just to clarify, was not what last week's sermon was about. Last week's sermon on backsliding, though a little bit intense, I, I grant you, was simply our methodology of preaching through expository sermons on a particular book of the Bible, in this case, the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah, in these chapters of 57, 58, 59, he has a lot to say about sin. These are challenging chapters. I fully grant to you, in some ways, uh, Isaiah is preaching essentially like, call, uh, come to Jesus, call to repentance, turn or burn type sermons in these couple of chapters. And so, just so you know, what I'm trying to do up here is just be faithful to the text. Every week, I come and I say, what does this text say? And last week's was on the danger of backsliding. And so I let us have it from Isaiah chapter 57, verse 17. And I just want you to know, though, though we're not going to cover chapter 58 and 59, that, that Isaiah doesn't let up, and I'm not going to let up either. Because that's what a prophet does. He speaks the word of God to the people of God. I'm not a prophet, but I'm an expository preacher. And so I preach what's there. And so Isaiah continues in chapter 58. He says this, cry aloud, do not hold back. All right, I won't. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgressions, to the house of Jacob their sins. So there should be times then 
where a pastor preaches on sin and warns his people that if you don't turn, you will be ruined by the judgment of God. In chapter 59, we're not going to cover this much today either, but Isaiah continues on this theme. He says in Isaiah 59 too, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. Imagine that. There's a gulf between the sinner and God, because God is holy and honestly we're not without Christ, right? And if you're feeling that there is a tremendous chasm of separation between you and God, you know what the problem is. The problem is sin. And so in these chapters, 57, 58, and 59, Isaiah lets loose with prophetic denunciations of transgression and rebellion. And that's what I have to do when I come to those texts too. However, in chapter 60 today, it is all joy. It is all good news in chapter 60. I don't know if you've uh, read the whole chapter in your, in your private time preparing for this morning, but Isaiah 60 is all joy. It is all light. It starts off in verse 1. I hope you have your Bible open with me this morning. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Now, when Isaiah tells his people, arise, which means get up, right? There's a time to lay down. There's a time to sit down. There's a time to put your head down. And there's a time to stand up and rise. And not only does Isaiah say to the people, it's time to get up, it's time to stand up, it's time to be recognized, it's time to be seen, it's time to get off your face, it's time to get on your feet, but not only get up, he says to shine, be bright, be resplendent, be luminant, let hope waft off of you. Rejoice, people, he says, and I, I can almost hear Isaiah's people commenting back to him as he tells them to get up and shine for your light has come. Well, what do we have to be joyful about? Because thinking back to the context in which Isaiah is preaching these sermons, I mean, let's just go through our, our redemption history a little bit here. 722 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel is destroyed by Assyria. 586 BC, you probably know this by heart. We've been going over this. Uh, Babylon comes and takes Jerusalem into exile. 70 years they suffered. For 70 years, the people of God dragged out to the foreign land. Their best warriors conquered, their city destroyed, their gates knocked down, their walls superseded, dragged into exile. And you can almost rightly hear the people of God kind of like shouting back at Isaiah, what do we have to be joyful about? We, we, have, we lost our land. We haven't won a war in a while. Our women have been taken from us. Our children taken captive. Our temple's been robbed. What in the world do we have to stand up and shine brightly about? 60 verse 1. And you may be saying to yourself, well, same thing for us, right? Here we are, the people of God, gathered together on the Lord's Day, and, and we don't necessarily feel like celebrating either. In fact, when you look out at the culture today, it's like we've got a lot more to lament than to celebrate. We got COVID-19 ravaging, seems like it's back. Here we go again. Thought we were done with this, right? Church attendance is down almost everywhere. We're actually up and so are those faithful churches that are still open and preaching the gospel. A lot of them are closed though. Nationwide attendance is down. We got CRT and BLM movements splitting our nation into warring factions that practically hate each other now. The polar polarization now is so strong. You can't even talk to your neighbors anymore. It's only been a few months since the riots tore apart our cities. Murder is rampant in many of our metropolises in this nation. I don't know what the murder rate's gonna be in Chicago this weekend. It seems like it keeps topping previous records every week heretofore. Our universities, which were once great, are now practically indoctrination machines. Our lives are filled with increasing amounts of outright disinformation, propaganda. It's hard to tell the truth anymore about anything, from the media at least. We got the 20th anniversary of 9-11, one of the low points of our history, reminding us of that judgment of God. And now this other judgment, COVID, upon our nation. Not a lot to be excited about. And yet here in Isaiah 60, verse 1, the same thing is told to us that Isaiah told to his people, arise and shine. This is actually our time to stand up and to be luminant, radiant, 
hopeful, joyful. You say, why? I'll give you five reasons why we have to be joyful this morning. Let's get into this text. Isaiah 60, verse 1, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has arisen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. So the first theme that Isaiah draws out here is this idea of light. And throughout all of the scriptures, um, if you wanted to summarize the whole Bible in three words, you might say light dispels darkness. That's the message of the whole Bible right there. Right, it goes back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and there was chaos and darkness. The scripture says in Genesis 1 verse 2, it says the earth was without form and void and darkness over the face of the deep. And then guess what? Verse 3 of Genesis 1, the, and God said, let there be light and there was light. And this beautiful, streaming, glorious, resplendent beams begin to slice through whatever was of the universe at 186,000 miles per second. That's how fast light travels. Still boggles my mind. And light screams into the chaos and into the darkness, and so creation begins. Several days later in the creation story, we're told God said, Verse 14 of Genesis 1, let there be light, and, and there was light in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the nights, and let there be for signs and seasons, so God creates the stars and the sun, and then guess what? Our universe is filled with light, which allows us to see and allows us to see the beauty of all he has made. God could make a beautiful world. We wouldn't know it if we didn't have light. So yeah, there's darkness. Fall comes in Genesis 3, but then guess what? Christ comes into the world. He is the light of the world. And if we go to John's Gospel, chapter 1, you don't have to go there if you want to just stay in Isaiah, but, but you know John's, John's Gospel. It's a retelling of the creation story. And there John tells us in 1-4, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This time we're not talking about creation itself. We're talking about Christ coming into the world who is not only the light bearer, but he is light itself. He is the true light. He says in verse 9, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. We're talking about the incarnation of Christ. And so creation is described as light. The coming of Christ is described as light. And guess what? Salvation is described as light too. Right? Because whenever a person gets saved, here's what Paul says about it in 1 Corinthians chapter six, 4, verse 6. For God, excuse me, 2 Corinthians, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? What, is, what does it mean to be saved? It, well, it means that God has shown in our hearts to give the light, the light of what? The, of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So throughout the Bible, here's the, here's the point. Light goes out dispelling darkness, Right? In creation, in the gospel, and even in an in individual salvation, it's like light beaming into the dark place of the heart. And so now in Isaiah 60, our text today, the prophet picks up on this well-used biblical metaphor for hope and joy, and he begins to apply it, though, to redemption history. And so when Isaiah, in Isaiah 60, he's talking about light coming into the darkness, He's talking about the, the, the historical unfolding of God's redemptive plan. That too is like light. You say, well, how so? Well, the prophets were like that pre-dawn light in the morning where the prophets are telling us that this great day is coming. If you ever get up just a few moments before dawn, it's already light right before the sun comes up. And then when Christ comes into the world, it's like the sun coming up to the horizon and you can see it. I saw it in the, my rearview mirror on the way to church this morning. Beautiful and glorious. And as the sun begins to, to traverse its way through the sky, all of a sudden the, the, the sun, the power of it, begins to melt off the morning mist and the dew. And then before you know it, it's in full radiant power over the sky at noon. And here's Isaiah telling us that this is what's going to happen in the unfolding of redemption history. Now, now notice the tense of the verbs here. It's, it seems to be future tense, right? For behold, darkness shall cover the earth. All right, so, so there's darkness now, no question about that. More coming, more darkness, yes? But, look, verse two, for behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness to people's butts. 
The Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you. So even as the gospel begins to unfold in redemption history, Christ is born into the world. The spirit is given at Pentecost. The church begins to grow as the kingdom of God, yet more and more light. So that's the trajectory here. Not more and more darkness, but more and more light. And whenever we tend to get despairing about the things that are happening in our day, don't forget that the, that the, the trajectory of redemption history is towards more light, not less. And so you say, well, Pastor Matt, that doesn't make sense because I look around me, I read the newspaper, I know there's a lot of bad things happening. Guess what? Me too. Me too. I can see that. But, but the problem is too often we Christians, we have what we might call a chronological nearsightedness. Okay? Chronological nearsightedness or a historical myopia wherein we, we tend to interpret the whole scope of redemption history merely based on the slice of what's happening today. Right? And so if we, if we have a bad string, if we have a bad week, if we have a bad 20 years, if we have a bad 100 years, we tend to think that things are going down, that things are getting worse. We have a national tragedy here. Uh, we have a Supreme Court decision that we cannot abide there. And we tend to think of our, to ourselves that everything is falling apart. But in reality, if you could just step back from, from maybe 20 years to a lifetime, or from one lifetime to 10 lifetimes, or from 10 lifetimes to a millennia, then it becomes more and more clear that the light is in fact conquering the darkness. I know it's hard to see it with just a sliver of time though, all right? And so, I mean, don't get me wrong, dark times are afoot. War, famine, pestilence, these things are going to come but the name and the glory of Christ is slowly brightening the nations, Isaiah 60 says, until his church is established everywhere and God is going to be gathering his elect from the four corners of the earth. That's unstoppable. The light will conquer the darkness. So you have that to rejoice about. Now let's look at it, something else here in verse 3. Look at this. The nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. I, I challenge you to, when you read your Bible, especially the Old Testament, including the prophets and particularly the Psalms, I want you to begin to notice how often, it's almost all the time, that the prophets or the psalmists will tell you that the nations are going to come. That the nations are going to be one to Christ as his king. And that's exactly what we see happening throughout redemption history, if you can back up and look big picture. Now you probably wondered this morning, I wouldn't blame you, why in the world we read the story of the Magi here in, what is it, second week of September, right? You probably thought, bulletin error, Pastor Matt probably meant Matthew 20, verses one to 12, but no, Matthew two, we're looking at the story of the Magi this morning. Why in the world? Why would we do that? We save that for December, right? heard of Christmas in July, but it's not July and it's not December either. So what's going on here? Well, I'll, I'll tell you why we selected Matthew 2 as our supplemental New Testament reading this morning is because Matthew 2, the coming of the Magi, is what we might call a literal typological fulfillment of Isaiah 60. The coming of the Magi is a harbinger. It's, it was a historical event, I have no doubt. I believe all these events are historical in the scriptures, but some of them are significant in their symbolic importance. They're types of what is to come. And when the Magi came to adore Christ at the manger, they were fulfilling this great prophecy of Isaiah chapter 60. How so? Well, did you notice all the parallels? There's a stunning amount of, of parallels between Isaiah chapter 60 and Matthew chapter 2. We have a great light. Shining, right? We've got the star in the story of the Magi indicating the way. We've got the nations coming to the light in verse 3. We've got the Magi traversing over mountain and over river and through the deserts to get to Christ in Matthew chapter 2. We have them bringing their wealth and bringing their treasures, which is exactly what the Magi did. In fact, it's interesting here. Did you notice verse 6 in Isaiah 60? 
what it is that they're bearing to offer as their praise and worship. It says, they shall bring gold and frankincense. They shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. So even the, the very tokens of worship and adoration that they bring in Matthew, frankincense, gold, and myrrh are the same here in Isaiah 60, verse 6, gold and frankincense. And so these magi, they're just the beginning. They're like the crack in the dam. They're like the first drops of the rain. The nations are going to come to Christ. And it's happening even now, if you can just back up and look at it. I mean, think about this for just a moment with me here. Paul, the apostle, in the book of Romans, he desperately wants to get to Spain. That's his goal. That's why he's writing the book of Romans. He wants to let them know he wants to get to Spain so that he can bring the gospel to Europe. What do you think Paul would imagine if he would have known that 1,500 years later at the time of Martin Luther, there would be tens of millions of Christians in Europe? I think it would have fell out of his chair, probably. The nations came, the Franks and the Gauls and the Picts and the Celts and the Goths and the Vandals. Europe experienced a tremendous revival in the Reformation period of the 500s and thereafter. It took more than a millennia to happen. It's very slow, but it happened. And what do you think Luther in the 1500s would have thought if he could have possibly known that there would be tens of millions of believers on the other side of the ocean here today in the Americas? Probably would have fell out of his chair. And what do you think Jonathan Edwards at the Great Awakening in the 1740s would have thought if he would have known, if somebody could have told him that there would be tens of millions of believers in South America, in Brazil, and in Africa? Okay, well, maybe Edwards would not have been so surprised because Edwards was called a post-millennialist theologically. Now, hang with me here for just a second. But uh, when we think about the end times, when we think about eschatology, there's all kinds of different views, as you know. And some of these we're going to learn when we come to the book of First and Second Thessalonians, which is the next book we're going to preach in our sermonic series. And then after that, we're going to go to Joel, then we're going to go to Revelation. So you're going to get a lot of eschatology in the days to come. But post-millennialism is the most optimistic view of all. There are some others that are largely pessimistic. But post-millennialists, they think that things are going to uh, get better. They think that the world is going to improve in knowledge and science and philosophy and especially in faithfulness to Christ until the world is largely a Christianized kingdom of Christ on earth. And then Jesus is going to return and he will have established his global Catholic universal kingdom. Right. So that's postmillennialism in a nutshell. Now, hang with me. Edwards, my dead mentor. He interpreted verse 9 in our text today. Look at your Bible with me for just a second here. In a very particular way. Because in verse 9 of chapter 60, it says, For the coastlands shall hope for me, the ships of Tarshish first, to bring your children from afar. Now, Edwards looked at that word coastlands, which Isaiah uses 14 times in the book of Isaiah. And he says, wait a second. That's us. That's the Americas. That's the colonies. That's New England. And so Edwards personalized verse 9 as to refer to the Great Awakening in the day that he experienced in the 1740s. Now, later on, as he thought more about the revivals, as some of his views and some of his optimism was tempered a little bit as the revivals came and went, right? They wax and then they wane. But Edwards says, oh, yes, there's hope to come, no doubt. Now, even if you don't share that optimistic post-millennial theology of Edwards and some of the Puritans, the third thing we can re remark about in this particular text that I'm sure you'll agree with is that number three, our possession in Christ cannot be taken from us. So you have that to rejoice about. Our possession in Christ cannot be taken away from us. Look at verse 11. Your gates shall be open continually day and night. They shall not be shut, that people may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. Okay, so we have some symbolism here, and the symbolism relates to walls and gates. You can picture that, right? So gated cities in the ancient world are, are considered far more secure than ungated cities, for obvious reasons. The towns and the villages and 
uh, the, the, the little settings of small groupings of houses, they're exposed to plunderers, to aggression, to attack. But gated and walled cities are stronger and secure, right? Well, they were until Babylon came and ripped off the gates of the city walls of Jerusalem in 586 BC under Nebuchadnezzar. They brought their battering rams and they set up a siege and they waited until the people of the city of Jerusalem couldn't stand it anymore. And if you read the stories in the Kings and the Chronicles, the people made a mad dash for it to try to get out. And the people of Babylon chased them down in the fields. That's what happened. And so by the time Nehemiah comes back in in the 400s BC, he's got to repair all the gates. That's the point of the book of Nehemiah, right? And so all of this is future predictive prophecy from Isaiah's perspective. But notice what he says here. It's a metaphor that all of the Jews would have recognized as being very good news here in verse 11. Picture the metaphor. Your gates shall be open continually day and night. They shall not be shut that people may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. Okay, so here we have the gated city and the gates are wide open. But this time the gates are not wide open because invaders kicked them down. The gates are wide open because there's no threat. There's no threat. There's no enemy that can come and take away what you have. Nobody can rob you of that which is precious to you. And of course, the book of Revelation takes the same language from Isaiah 60 and it applies it to heaven and it describes heaven as a place where the gates are never shut in the city because there's no night anymore. David and I were just the other day sitting with Rob and Gloria. Gloria is probably passing into glory, by the way, if you didn't know that already. Uh, but we read some of those passages from Revelation. And the Revelation is so hopeful because here's a time and a place where there's no tears, there's no crying, there's no mourning, there's no pain. And both John, the apocalyptic writer, and Isaiah the prophet, they both use this image of a city whose gates are left wide open because there's no threat. And believer, that's you in Christ. They could take away anything from you. They could take away uh, any physical object from you. Even your freedoms may be taken away in this nation, your health. But the one thing that the gates are always left open because there's no threat is that your salvation in Jesus Christ cannot be plundered from you. All right, let's do a couple more here. Number four, we should rejoice. We should stand and arise and shine forth because, ready, many of our enemies will be converted by grace. That's right. Look at verse, let's see here, 14. The sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you. And all who despised you shall bow down at your feet. Now, if you look out at the world today and you see people that you don't like, uh, maybe not physical enemies, but ideological enemies, people who teach exactly the opposite of what we teach here at Gospel Fellowship, people who would threaten the liberties that you cherish for yourself, and you say to yourself, those are my ideological opponents. Just keep in mind that perhaps in the goodness of God's grace and favor, many of those people who are now the enemies of God will one day be brought into alliance and allegiance with Christ and with you. Isn't that possible? Yes, of course it's possible. How do I know? Because we were once enemies of God. Romans 5.10, we were the enemies of God. And then guess what happened? We don't like to think of ourselves as enemies. We like to think of ourselves as pretty good people. But the scriptures tell us that the man before he's been converted by Christ is actually the enemy of God. And yet something happened. The Spirit of God wrought savingly upon us, changed our hearts, converted us, convicted of us of our sins, drew us into his saving favor, caused us to be born again, gave us his spirit. And here we are today, right? Enemies of God now converted. And what do you think? That's going to stop? No way. God is going to continually 
draw his enemies to himself. And so this verse in Isaiah 60, 14 only describes that the sons of those who afflicted you, your former enemies, those who hated you, those who hated Christ, those who hated the gospel, what's going to happen to them? Well, many of them, some of them are going to come bending low to you. All who despised you shall bow down at your feet. You say, give me an example. Glad you asked. How about Nebuchadnezzar himself? Nebuchadnezzar himself, who led the Babylonian armies against the city of Jerusalem, 586 B.C. What do we read about him in Daniel 4, right? Well, let's look it up. Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 4, the obvious and apparent enemy of God, and yet God absolutely humiliates him, draws him low, sends him into a state and a fervor of madness in Daniel chapter 4. And we read this, Daniel 4, 34, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. The very enemy of God, now humbled, and confessing with his mouth the lordship of Jehovah God, the God of Israel. How about that? How about the centurion who oversaw the crucifixion of Christ? Is that an enemy? Did he command his men to pound the nails into the wrists and the feet of the Savior? Did he oversee the very flogging of Christ? And yet as this man, the centurion, stands there before the crucified Christ on Calvary... As the mountain is now shaking and as the sky darkens and as the tombs are letting forth the dead, read Matthew's gospel, what happens to the centurion? He stands there with his mouth agape and he confesses, surely this was the Son of God. Or how about the Apostle Paul who hated Christians? Paul on the Damascus Road, Acts 9, he's going to persecute the Christians. He wants them in jail or better, dead. And yet God knocks him off his horse, converts him, and now he's the apostle to the Gentiles. How about this? Let me throw this out there. I, I think Isaiah 60, 14 may have some particular reference to Rome itself. That's right. The great empire in the time of Christ. Because Rome was once the very enemy of the Christian faith. Pontius Pilate was the one who crucified Christ. Nero, the emperor, was the one who killed Paul and Peter. Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor, was the one who tortured Christians and threw them into the Colosseums. And yet, 312 years later, when Constantine comes, Rome is largely converted and Christianized in great measure. Now, was everybody saved? No, of course not. But it's certainly inexplicable how one empire that hated Christianity so much could completely turn around within 300 years. And so, so here we are today. When, whenever you see someone in your personal life, or whether this person has, is on the news, or whether they've said something ridiculous, or it's somebody in politics, or it's a pagan king of another nation, and you are saying to yourself, that is the worst person I could possibly imagine. They'd never come to Christ. They're a thousand miles from the gospel. And don't forget Isaiah 60, 14, that the sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you, and all who despised you shall bow down at your feet. God is not done converting his enemies. Many of them will be saved. Not all, but many. And finally, I want to mention this morning... The one great truth that we can always rejoice in. The one thing that will always cause us to stand with our back straight and our chin up is simply this, that our God does not change. Look at verse 16. You shall suck the milk of the nations. You shall nurse at the breast of kings. And you shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer the mighty one of Jacob. Here is the good news for you this morning. We have a God and a Savior who does not change. He was good yesterday. He is good today. He will be good tomorrow. He is sovereign yesterday, sovereign today, sovereign tomorrow. 
He is gracious and merciful and filled with steadfast love yesterday and today and tomorrow. Our God never changes. And this is very, very good news for us because that means we don't have to wake up one day and worry that somehow our position has changed before him. No, no. The immutability of God, that is to say his changelessness, is our steadfast rock and our comfort and our strength. There's all kinds of things that could happen to us in this world. There's all kinds of things, both good and bad, both light and dark, that may happen in this nation. But the one thing that we know is not going to change is God's very essential nature. That is reliable. And so what do I say? What do we say to a generation that is concerned about the times in which we live? Certainly strange times indeed. I think we all acknowledge that. What do we say? Well, we say the same thing that Isaiah says in 61, arise. It's not time to hide. It's not time to stoop down low. It's not time to duck your head. It's not time to wallow in self-pity on the ground. It's time to arise, which means stand up on your feet. It means be counted. It means be known. It means do not be ashamed, not even for a second. Okay? We're going to stand. We're going to be recognized. We are not going to hide. And then what we're going to do is we're going to shine. We're going to stand first, and then we're going to shine. And shine means let the light beam forth to you from Christ and through you as the Spirit of God works in your life. Don't ever be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let's go ahead and stand up together. We're going to sing hymn number 310 this morning as we close our service.
Remain standing for the benediction. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his grace and his favor. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace. Thank you.